you know, some people thought that you know, maybe Ghost Riders in the Sky was a little too advanced for kindergartners, but I think we underestimate kindergartners. <laughs> it is hard to imagine gathering for worship without any music at all. There are Quakers, some of whom practice sitting in silence together, waiting for the spirit to stir. Early Quakers believed that written music and their, that organized singing didn't match their sensibilities and ideal of spontaneous worship. Spontane spontaneity can occur also in a structured space. Perhaps you've experienced a sense of wonder and awe, a palpable closeness of divine presence when singing a hymn or listening to a choir who has carefully prepared an anthem. Music has been a central part of religious experience throughout history, all around the globe, in, in every religious tradition. We know the people of Israel engaged in singing and playing instruments as expressions of devotion and worship. Early Christians continued this tradition, singing hymns, began creating their own hymns, the Magnificat, Mary's words of praise in Luke's gospel are echoes of Hannah's song from the Hebrew Bible and is considered a hymn. The opening of John's gospel is a hymn. Other hymn frag fragments can be found in the epistles. Hymns are poetry wedded to music intended to communicate theological and Christological ideas, complexities, if you will, woven, woven together with music, settle into the spirit in very deep ways. We don't have the actual music, the tunes anymore from those hymn fragments, but the words remain. First Christian Church of Pomona is a descendant of the Restoration Movement. Having instruments in worship was a bone of contention among churches in the Restoration Movement, sometimes also called the Brotherhood. We, we wisely dropped that. It took us a while, but we wisely dropped that declination. Most Churches of Christ refuse to allow any instruments of any kind in worship because instruments are not mentioned in the New Testament, therefore they should not be in worship of New Testament so-called churches. Most churches of Christ were theologically very fundamentalist and uh, primarily in the Southern states. The first minister of this congregation, Brother Tibbs, had apparently patched up a division over the use of an organ a pipe organ in St. Louis. Music had an important place in the ministry of this congregation almost from the very beginning. By 1981, there was a committee on singing, the forerunner of the choir. They met on Saturday evenings to practice and their main task was the cultivation of congregational singing, not performance, but to make sure all of us felt like we were supported in singing. The primary place of music in the life of the church was in worship and at evangelistic meetings. George Waters was a primary mover behind the music program then. Piano, organ, various instruments were employed at those evangelistic meetings and Mr. Waters organized a permanent choir in 1896 and led it until his death in 1917. Never give up, never surrender. <laughs> the first paid choir director, he did that without being paid. The first paid choir director was hired in March of 1920. Ray Crittenden was paid $75 a month for his services and also formed male and female community choruses, which uh, featured heavily uh, voices from First Christian Church. Get this, a church orchestra was organized in 1923. People learned to read music in the olden days. I like to say they were bilingual because to learn music is to learn another language. 
The congregation already had its own pipe organ built in Boston, Massachusetts, 1910, and that's the one that sits in the sanctuary today. Music continued to play a vital part in the development of the congregation throughout the 20th century, giving people a place to form community. You know how much community is formed when we're rehearsing and practicing and laughing? And giving people a place to share in creative expression and amplify the praise of God. In the 1960s, uh, the Future Builder Sunday School class had a number of musically inclined members, including our own Nancy DeWolf. For about five years, they presented Gilbert and Sullivan operettas in the Fellowship Hall. Yes, a lot of Pirates of Penzance and HMS Pinafore. The Chancel Choir and Bell Choir held a, a yearly dinner and concert to raise funds for a retreat they held. And it, it was a working retreat. We practiced and learned new things like the Rudder Requiem. The Chancel Choirs presented that in worship, the, has presented Bach cantatas and Benjamin's, Br Benjamin Britten's Ceremony of Carols and more. Whenever we have reflected together as a congregation, um, like when we did appreciative inquiry, talked about what's important to us, the things that we value, Music is always articulated as highly valued, an important part of our communal life, always. It always rises up to one of the top things. And why is that? Why spend money, staff resource, which is money, more money, uh, precious time on music when there are so many other pressing matters to address. Homelessness, hunger, domestic violence, poverty. Why? Music and other arts were slowly weeded out of the Los Angeles public schools where I attended K through 12. I wanted to be a music teacher at one point, <laughs> but figured, you know, they're getting rid of all of those jobs. <laughs> Maybe that's not such a good career option. I don't know that I picked wisely as, any, as that goes now, but there you have it. But why spend money, staff resource, precious time on music in the face of low test scores, dropping graduation rates? Why? I want to know why music and other arts get blamed for the problems they had nothing to do with. If anything, the arts have kept and keep many children and young people in school. There's overwhelming evidence that music especially helps the brain develop capacity for complex thinking. And besides, it's fun. <laughs> what happened to let's enjoy school? Let's have fun. Let's enjoy together, to being together. Let's enjoy life. Music adds quality and creativity and enjoyment to our lives. A couple of weeks ago, I started doing music at the Child Development Center for the first time in over 15 years. I used to go in there once in a while, and, and we'd do music together. So, just so you know, I am spending your preset precious resource of staff time to sing with preschoolers, two, three, and four-year-olds. Their teacher told me, it's the first time two of the students sat still, paying attention for more than a minute. In fact, they sat for almost 15 minutes. And for any preschooler, that's pretty amazing. Music is powerful. It's powerful. Music brought comfort to Paul and Silas as they sat and sang hymns in prison. When you need comfort, what music do you turn to for comfort? Hmm? What lifts your spirits? When the early Christians sought to express their ideas, their experience of Jesus, and who this Jesus was to them, they set it to music. 
What songs and hymns give deep expression to your ideas of faith, to your feelings of hope, your love for God and God's love for you? Eddie Hillisum wrote in her diary that prayer, contemplative prayer in particular, is how we safeguard that little piece of God that is in ourselves. Eddie knew how hard and precious that work is, living the final days of her life in Auschwitz concentration camp, where she was murdered along with hundreds of thousands of people, almost all of them Jewish. Music is a way we safeguard I believe music is the way we safeguard that little piece of God that doesn't have to be so little, that's inside ourselves. It's a way we blow some air on the embers of the spirit and warm our soul. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo from the second and third century, is said to have written this about prayer and music. Those who sing pray twice. There's something in the music and something in the words. You you pray twice. So even just humming is a prayer. Do we come together to sing, to join our voices each week, remembering this, that, that we are joining our voices in prayer? Sometimes it's a reflective and quiet prayer. And sometimes it's expressive and loud. Sometimes it's questioning and wondering what we believe, if anything. <laughs> and sometimes it's, it's an assurance and a peace that passes even our understanding. Singing and music in all of its forms is a way we communicate with the ineffable, with the inexpressible, with often indescribable presence of the sacred in and among us. When Eddie Hillisum wrote that, it is safeguarding, that prayer is safeguarding that little piece of God in ourselves, I think that our singing together is the way we safeguard the with the presence of God among the community. When we sing together, I invite you to consider, each time we sing together, that we are safeguarding the presence of God and who God wants us to be. Every time we do that, every time we sing together, that's an act of faith, if ever there was one. I invite us to join our voices as we sing this song when in our music, God is glorified. We don't, I don't know if we've ever sung this song before. Jessica and Pam are gonna help me sing this. It's on page something in our hymnal. (laughs) Seven, thank you. Page seven, for those of us who read music, it might be useful to look at the notes go up and down. And uh, I invite us to stand as we, in body and spirit and sing together.